It's kind of hard to believe that this is real life and not satire. Under New York law, social media networks must create a system for users to report online speech the state disfavors and endorse the state's mislabeling of some speech as hateful conduct. In other words, the First Amendment freedoms of satirical websites like the Babylon Bee hinge on whether they'll adopt and help enforce the state's ideology. But free speech shouldn't turn on whether the government has a sense of humor. It's clear, government officials are trying to bypass the First Amendment to keep ideas they disagree with out of the marketplace. Join ADF as they stand with the Bee and others in defense of free speech. Just $19 a month will fuel the stand to help protect our freedoms. Join ADF.com slash B and pledge your monthly gift of $19 or more to ADF. Together, we will boldly advance our right to live and speak the truth. Every gift helps. Go to joinadf.com slash B and stand for free speech with your gift today. The Babylon B Podcast. That's what I think. That's how he says it, right? Yeah. It's a trap. That's what I remember. Yeah, the way that people say it or like it's on memes is. That's how I say it. It's a trap. No, but you're 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 even putting more on trap. You're more putting more emphasis on. I I, I disagree. Look. It's a trap. It's a trap. I I think still think you're yelling trap too much. I mean the pitch is the same. It's a trap. I, I, it's a trap. It, he, he almost. It's a trap. He goes up in pitch, but he doesn't really go up in volume. He's like. It's, it's a, a trap. trap. It's a trap. I think they. I can't hear Kyle. I think they leveled out. I think they leveled out his volume. I like I'm with say, the compressor. All I'm saying is like the memes and stuff about that. Oh. It's always like it's a trap. Here's, here's another. <laughs> oh, here's is? another thing. If you don't have the face of a squid creature, you have to lean into the voice a little bit more to translate. So, like I tell people when they're learning new languages, think of the stereotypical accent and kind of lean into that because chances are, if you lean into that, you are going to sound more like that language than you are than with an american accent two things you make it sound like you actually teach a language course yeah like you're uh oh do you really i i've, I've taught people languages before oh. yeah what languages or dialect like dialects or, or languages uh language so language what no language? not the inverted grief card english <laughs> to people that speak mandarin or uh, yes oh, i exclusively mandarin <laughs> yes chinese i assume Some kind of chinese is that what you're talking about? So that's I, I I have taught dialects before. Oh yeah. It's a trap. Right. So you like have to lean into the jowliness. Right. It's a trap. Just, it's a trap. Just to translate to people. I was still well, the compressor. It's a trap. <laughs> I think the, the the compressor keeps it from, you know, from the the volume from crescendoing. Here's another Star Wars uh, quote. Uh, Travis, can you identify it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, it's nub nub. Nyan yub. Yeah. Yes, it, whatever his name is. Yum yum. Meow meow. Yeah, he was my favorite character. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not really. Mine was yeah. Ray. You know, when I was little. I'm Ray. Oh, my, my favorite character was Wicket. Do you think anybody's Neither favorite character is Rose Tico? Like, is there any kid? Now, I'm, so, not talking, I'm not talking about woke people. I'm talking about some okay, kid so, at home that like watches Star Wars. Oh, I was one of that action figure. I doubt it, but I know we lean a lot into the Rose jokes. I I don't get. It. I I liked Rose. I liked Rose. Okay, from from the movies. She was fine until the very end sure. with the whole that taking out Finn thing. That was weird. Yeah, that was weird. But other than that, her character is fine. And you could take that to the bank. <clears throat> it's like, don't you know the meaning of a noble sacrifice? Like, yeah. what do you yeah. understand what I'm yep. doing? Like, that was just that like, was, oh, you're going to yeah. kill yourself. He's like, yeah, that was the whole thing. That's the whole point. <laughs> that's that's the entire thing. Um, that's why I'm here. She's she's like, we're not gonna we're not gonna win by fighting what we hate, but by saving what we love. He's like, well, I was about to save what, what I love by blowing this thing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And why won't you let it? me do that? <laughs> and now everybody's dead. And now we're all dead. Rose. <laughs> rose <laughs> that's a stupid rose well everybody now uh, that you have been uh, introduced to our discussion on admiral akbar it's a pop. Uh, travis what are you doing with the facial hair is this gonna mm. no it's going to go away it is yes oh i kind of like it does Thank your wife you. not like it no she likes it too except for the uh roughness if you know what i mean it's oh, like boy. sand oh boy i probably shouldn't say that <laughs> it's like uh, sand it's coarse and and, and it gets uh, everywhere and rough yeah and, the roughness. Um, Eek. Mm. No, I just, I just curious. So she likes it, but you're not going to keep it. No, I, I also, I think I have a little bit of a Drew Carey problem here, where I'm like, oh, that doesn't look like Travis. We can't. We, we're treating him too seriously. That's what Colin's talking said. about after Drew Carey lost to say the weight. Name, he said, 
no, not his weight. His the fact that he has to wear glasses to make he has laser eye vision. He has laser eye vision. <laughs> he has twenty twenty now because he had LASIK. <laughs> but he keeps wearing his glasses because that's how he's. That's how he's. Would known. you would you consider just for a sketch continuing to grow it out mm-hmm. and then shaving everything but the mustache? We have a particular sketch. In <laughs> it's a it's a sketch where we're just gonna say sweet stash, bro. It's a weird over sketch. and over. But um, no, yeah, I I mean I grew it out for the apostle. The Apostle Hoax one. Yep. Resurrection Hoax, which was, is my favorite sketch, probably. I also cut myself Mine shaving too. right here, very close to my eye. What were you shaving? <laughs> and that's, and I was like, like, so I'll shave, I use a, like a razor just to shave up here. Mm-hmm. And I was just like kind of getting this stuff. And I don't know why, but I like, I like went super high and I was like, are you, are you like secretly like one of those Mexican wolf, wolfman no, brothers? I, I have to <laughs> shave. Where like, the hair starts about right here. It's like, oh, I cut myself shaving and it's like up here, you know. Mm-hmm. It's like, Where is it? Do you still have that? Yeah, look. See this red? Oh, yeah. That looks like, like you got punched in the eyeball. It's like way up on my eye. My yeah. wife didn't punch me or anything. <laughs> Or I anything. am the alpha male. I fell down the stairs. <laughs> I'm going to show up with like a like a bruise. I cut myself shaving. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone, this is a fun episode. We, well, maybe it will be. Where we're going to count down five books from each of us that we think you should read. Mm. Now, for my list, I don't know how you guys did it. I didn't particularly choose my five favorite books. Yeah. And I didn't particularly choose like... I, I, I try not to pick ones that I've talked about recently, like my reading list from last mm-hmm. year. Sure. And such, although there, a couple made it on there. On other ground rules, did we exclude like ones that we are pretty sure that everyone knows we would recommend, like Bible? Are you excluded Bible and Lord of the yeah. Rings? I, ex- I excluded Lord of right. the Rings. I just try. I tried to pick ones that maybe are a little more yeah, on the, okay. off I, the beaten. Path. I think we're all on the same page then. Travis is literally like looking. He's sweating. His <laughs> his oh. list is all Bible, <laughs> Bible books, different uh, books of the Bible, Ephesians, <laughs> Ephesians. <laughs> I mean, it was really easy to get to five. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Uh, why don't you start us out, Jarrett, with your number five book that our re- readers and listeners should read. Okay. Number five. I'm, so this is, this is for the Christian audience out there, but it is a very challenging um, book that I read about 20 years ago that really made a difference in my walk. Um, it was so great <clears throat> that you didn't read it for 20 years. <laughs> no, I have read it multiple okay, times. Right. But it's one of those that was in my grandfather's spiritual library that I inherited from him, but I had already read it like three times and I didn't know it was part of his like journey too. So it was really interesting. But Goosebumps. It's re- no, sure. re- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's right. Honorable Snowman of Pasadena. Yeah, <laughs> I was trying to think of a, of a title. Of <clears throat> <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's called... Whoa, the door oh. just locked. <laughs> After we start talking about Goosebumps, now I'm scared. <laughs> it's called Reese Howell's Intercessor. That's in the title? That's the name of the book. Wait, what? By a guy named Norman Grubb. So Reese Howells, not the... Reese Howells is the name. It's a biography about a guy named Reese Howells. Ah, okay. That was... uh, Is he Mr. Howell from Gilligan's Island? No. No. He was a a poor Welshman that really followed Christ. Yeah, he's a really interesting guy. Very obedient Christian and a lot of crazy stuff happened. I thought life. you were going to say very obese. He's a very I thought obese. That's a weird takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a good book though. And it was very challenging. I'm not sure. I, I don't know how I, much I agree with all the theology in it anymore, mm-hmm. but I do think that it was very challenging as, as a Christian. So it was helpful. I, I think you guys should, should read it. What can happen if somebody's right really, now, truly let's obedient? Stop the podcast and truly obedient to the Holy Spirit. The rest yes. of the podcast yeah. is us all <laughs> quietly sitting yeah. here reading every this. every fifteen minutes. <laughs> mm. oh. Oh. Mm. Chapter six is quite good. <laughs> oh, you're on chapter six already. Oh, I'm yeah. still oh. on chapter four. Awesome. I'm a quick reader. Yeah. My number five. I've, this breaks some of my rules because I talked about this one recently. My number five that I think everybody should read is "The Abolition of Man" mm-hmm. by C.S. Lewis. And the reason I picked this is I just reread it again, and I read it the year before, and I read it the year before. And it keeps coming back to me as one that I just want to read all the time. Mm-hmm. It's also only about 90 pages, and you can read it in a couple of hours, so there's no reason yeah. not to. Um, and it's one of those books that's like an onion that just, you know, peels back like an ogre. Like, like an the- ogre has layers, and you peel back the layers of the ogre. And there's just more and more to think about. And, and the more I read the book, the more prescient C.S. Lewis seems. Mm. Uh, about our current age with things like AI and Neuralink and all these technological advancements. And C.S. Lewis is standing there holding up a big stop sign and nobody's listening to him. 
I like how C.S. Lewis has a few of these books that are really, really short, but have like so much nuggets packed into them. Because for for people that want to pad their reading list, they're like, oh, this one's short. Yeah. And then it ends up being one of the best books you've ever read. I did that because I read, that was my right. 51st book I read last yeah. year, just to like pad it. And I was like, this is the best book I read all year. Yeah. 100% agree. <laughs> oh, yeah. So Abolition of Man, if you haven't read it, read it. And then send me an email. I'd love to, I'd love to hear uh, if you read it recently and what you thought. Podcast at BattleLombia.com. So would I. Have you seen the movie Conspiracy Theory with Mel Gibson? Yes. Well, I, I was, to be fair, I was not asking you. <laughs> Maybe? When did it come out? You only talked to him. So 1997. I thought I would just cheer. Just I might have seen it. Okay. Well, in the, in the movie, uh, Mel Gibson's character keeps buying Catcher in the Rye. And the way you talk about Abolition of Man, how you keep reading it, just makes me think that you are a secret assassin. Oh, and that's, he was an assassin? He was a conspiracy theory where everything, no, I'll let you, ne never mind, I'll let you finish. Okay, so Cat, is Catcher in the Rye your book? No. Oh, can okay. you act out the entire I've, movie? Um, I don't remember how it starts. It's been a long time since I've seen it. Thud. <laughs> fade oh. to black. Fade through black onto it. Fade in. So Mel I, Gibson is in a cab. <laughs> I didn't order my books in any particular order, and I was planning on <laughs> just re reading the name of my titles out in the in order of which ones I believe are least likely to be on the rest of your list so that I can sure. go to my it backup options sure. uh, when you guys inevitably uh, step on some of my list items. <laughs> but since you guys both put Christian books first, I feel like I have to jump straight to Mere Christianity. So Mere Christianity is a book everyone should read in their lifetime, Christian, non-Christian. <clears throat> um, and obviously, I mean, I think we've all read it, yes. Yeah. And uh, Have you read it, Travis? No, I have not. You've not read Mere Christianity? Mm -mm. Okay. I've read parts of it, I just haven't Are read you allowed? It. So as let's, a Church of yes, Christ? Yes, I'm allowed to. Okay. <laughs> so I'm allowed to read C.S. Lewis. So the rest as of long this, as no music is playing. Well, as long so. as you, as you, Cross your fingers while you read it. Okay. <laughs> so the rest of the podcast can just be Travis reading Mere Christianity. Yeah. And, uh, and all of us sitting around That'd be him. fascinating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that What part? do you think? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, That's I mean, good. I've read Screwtape Letters. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, oh. I've read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I think Screwtape's probably my favorite, Lewis. I didn't put it on my list just because I talk about it all. Um, but I think even for non-Christians, I think it's, it's useful to uh, hear the arguments for uh, Christianity and why we believe what we believe rather than the misrepresentation that's so often portrayed by media and the world around us. Good one. 100% agree. Good one. Well, we're three for three so far. <clears throat> uh, Travis, what was your? I picked the Bible. What was Bible. your spiritual pick? <laughs> <laughs> Did you pick the Bible? No. Oh. <laughs> because we, we weren't supposed okay, to. Yeah. I, I wanted to say that okay. to look better. Uh, what, what, what did you pick? Um, 1984. Oh, good. For... Obvious reasons. The Orwell one? Yeah. <laughs> yes, the George Orwell one. <laughs> Great, greatest book written by a socialist, yes. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, it's... it's. Do you think you know, he would be considered a socialist by... By today's standard, no. <laughs> no. By today's standard. Mm. Now he's just a normal bozo. Yeah. Mm. He's a fear monger. That is, a, that is quite good. I, I read it for the first time a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, for the younger audiences, be aware there are some parts yes. in it. Yeah, Correct. so... My 15-year-old is not allowed to read it yet, but I think it's very important reading for people over 18. Yeah. I'll be honest. I don't remember those parts, but... It's, there's a lot of calculus. <laughs> yeah. Oh, darn. <laughs> if you don't not have appropriate for a you. background in math, don't read it. <laughs> yeah. It, it, well, I mean, it's for the obvious government overstep mm -hmm. ideas. Uh, you know, all that stuff is... I'm not saying we're living in 1984 because we're not. It's 2024. <laughs> But, you know, it comes up all the time. Mm -hmm. It's a good uh, part of uh, literary culture to immerse yourself in. Yeah, and I feel it's a little cliche to reference. Like, people are like, oh, it's just like, but it's so true. <laughs> like, yeah, like, it's like, yes. yeah, but it works. <laughs> exactly. It's also one of those things that I think the left sometimes misattributes the motivations of, of the characters and entities in the book. And it's becomes rather clear that they haven't read it or understand the meaning behind right, it right. when they reference it. Yeah, I love 1984. I think we should remake it, but with an animal sidekick, and we can call it Winston Checks In. Winston? <laughs> a reference to a well, previous podcast. <laughs> what's the, what's the opening uh, line? It was a cold day in October. Of Dunstan Checks In? Yeah. Is and it the when the, clock the clocks were striking? 13. And the clocks oh, were yeah. striking 13. The opening line was, there's a monkey in this elevator. <laughs> and the opening line was, well, I guess that's just 1984. <laughs> <laughs> it truly was a Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny they realized they were no longer little girls <laughs> they were little women all right still what's little. your is it my turn number four. i thought it was yours 
No, you started okay, it. Okay, I, I did. I start. Okay, so... You started it. This guy. I, I, as long as we're getting into books that really were impactful, uh, I... the whole point of the Do you like to read... <laughs> Well, I thought it was like books you like. It could have it been is. that. Some of mine are that too. Some of mine are really dumb. So. Yeah. So, um, but the the book that I really one of the there's I'm gonna just lump a couple into the same thing because it's biographies. Um, but Eric Metaxas has written a couple of amazing biographies. I don't know if I can choose between the ones that I read, but Bonhoeffer um, was really profound. And again, like we're talking, you have about, a signed copy. I. <laughs> I, it's signed a few times now. <laughs> we, we were sitting at a table with Eric Metaxas and Jarrett was a huge fanboy. And he was like, can, can you sign my copy of Bonhoeffer? <laughs> and he's, he opened it up and it had already been signed. Yeah. And he's like, did you know Double this is already signed? I was like, yes, I did. Sign it again, please. <laughs> so he signed it again. Anyway, but um, his book on Bonhoeffer is really good. And if you look at the way Bonhoeffer dealt with the culture in the way that, you know, the theology of the church was being hijacked by academia and uh, eventually by the Nazis because they'd been weakened by the theology of the church, been weakened because of academia. And the Nazis were right. There was, it was ripe for the Nazi takeover so that that Nazi church was able to take over. And that's where they went first. Um, they went after the churches first uh, when they were taking over the country. And so I think we, we, we can learn a lot from that now as church people um, to not allow these kind of stupid so his Academics. Bonhoeffer biography and his Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> the other one was, so Bonhoeffer is amazing. The other one is obvious. I think it's uh, amazing. Grace was incredible. And the Luther biography was amazing. So Did you just three? I was going to say. I'm sorry, it's one. Extra. I think of them as one book. <laughs> I'd think of the entire author as one book. <laughs> Eric Metaxas is a love letter from God to us. Man, I love, I really love Eric Metaxas, but I, I think that his books. I can't wait for his brilliant. biography on Trump. It's going to be amazing. Called The Chosen One. <laughs> called Jesus too. <laughs> we love you, Eric. Electric yes. Boogaloo. Do love you. My number four is uh, another C.S. Lewis book, The Silver Chair. Mm. <gasps> Did I steal your... No, okay. no. I picked The Silver Chair because uh, it's one of the ones that gets lost in the uh, pile of countless Narnia books. Countless. Seven. So many. Seven. The countless books. You can't count them. In the box <laughs> of Narnia. It's kind of uh, arranged towards the end, I think, whether you're chronological or published order, and people get, uh, it just gets lost in the shuffle a little bit. It has, I, I like it because it expands the world of Narnia a little bit. They like go to the north and find the land of the giants, and it, it's just kind of one of those books that reads like a fun kid's bedtime adventure story, and yet... Like when they, Puddle Glum is a great character. And then when they go down in the depths and start to doubt whether Narnia ever really existed and the witch is telling them that was just all a fantasy and you made it up and they have to choose to believe even though they can't remember. Like there's just, there's just, I just read, I just spoiled the whole book. <laughs> no, no, you didn't. <laughs> but you didn't tell the end. But Silver Chair is highly recommended. And it's another one you can sit down and read in a couple hours. It's like when Jordan's recommending a movie, he then go, goes ahead and tells you the entire movie. <laughs> and it turned out to be gay. <laughs> and it's like, oh, well, I guess I don't need to You wouldn't see believe it what happened at the The end. two cowboys on a camping trip together. All right. The next out book on my list of 11 that I'm choosing at random is, um, I'll, I'll choose Mistborn. Mistborn by Brandon okay. Sanderson. I, I'm currently a fan of Brandon Sanderson because series? I was named after him. Uh, but uh, Mistborn, I think, is a good place to start in the series. It sets up a good uh, range of uh, his storytelling ability, his ability to craft a magic system, and his ability to craft a world and characters. Um, yeah, and I think this that particular trilogy ended decently, if if not a little bit more me. But. More, more me would be a reference to the Mormon nature of the book. And I'm holding out to my fandom of Brandon Sanderson right now because I fully expect within my lifetime I may not be a fan of his. Yeah. I felt at the end when Moroni showed up to save yeah. everybody <laughs> mm -hmm. to tell him what the true gospel was. That's I thought right. that was a little on the nose. Little but you don't you don't understand that there. that's just setting up for when they hide a, to to <clears> call up in the twinkling of an eye. Uh, yeah, yeah, but you know what? Brandon Sanderson's not going to believe in any of that stuff in a, in a few years anyway. He's just going. You think that, well that's he's the going to be a Frankfurt school marxist. Well, like, that's that's that's, what, that's the that's reason why I will not be a fan in the future. Not not because of the Mormi but because of the uh, the socialist, he's going to be a Jack Mormon real soon. The socialism, yeah. <laughs> would you rather socialistness? I said. Would you <laughs> Would you rather the Mormons took over America or the socialists? Mormons, yes. 
<laughs> or Brandon Sanderson. <laughs> Just Brandon Sanderson. Yeah. All right. So I'm enjoying his books while I can. Yeah. Well, do you, do you think it will ruin your rereads? No, I don't think so. I think I can. I enjoy Stephen King, even though he's right. A crazy I think I can separate yeah the art from the artist uh-huh. to an extent. Yeah. Lewis always said that. And too. to be fair, like enjoying Hitler's paintings. Yeah. <laughs> and currently, uh, Sanderson is very good at um, separating that in his in his books. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember there was a subplot in one of the books uh, that I was afraid was going a little socialist, and he effectively argued counterpoints that uh, he steel manned essentially. So. Mm. Yeah, he does, he does well at that. I, Lewis I says that you don't have to become a deist if you read books by deists. He's like, you can read anything and learn from their perspective. He's steel-manned and steel-hearted. Mm-hmm. And steel-hearted. Well done. What do you got, Travis? Number four. Action Comics number one. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, I mean, it might be worth reading, but I don't know. Have you ever read Action Comics number one? No, I have no. not. The the first super... Oh, actually, technically, I have Superman picks up a car. Oh. And it, you know... He's like, ah, get out of this car. Mm. No, there's people in the car just trying to... There's someone in the car. Okay. I thought he was just throwing it. <laughs> no. Uh, the original Superman is wild. He's a wild ride. He can go back in time. He can punch dinosaurs. Mm. Um, he doesn't fly. He just jumps really far. A leap tall buildings. Is that what you're Superman. recommending? Is the No, I'm not. Superman. I'm just... Oh. I got caught in a wormhole <laughs> just now. Sorry. <laughs> no. Um, speaking of Stephen King, The Shining. Mm. Ooh. Um, I wouldn't say it's his best work, but as a tale that's ultimately about alcoholism and <laughs> isolation. That was from the movie. It, Mrs. Torrance. Yes. Red rum. Ah. Um, you know, and the, the fact that he wrote it while like super drunk and then was later like, oh, this is about me. I just, there's just, it's kind of an amazing piece of work. Uh, for he what didn't even is. realize the, a, he didn't even word. realize like the whiskey that he was drinking in the book was a metaphor for the whiskey he was drinking in real life. I know, <laughs> <It's> amazing, <laughs> all right? Of, all of us has whiskey in our lives, <laughs> and for some of us, it's, it's actual. It's whiskey. actual, and most yeah. of us, it's real whiskey. I love I mean, The Shining. I would say The Shining is um, my favorite C- C.S. Lewis book. <laughs> we do have at Wait, least as a book. I realized I was mistake saying the wrong author name, and I just went with him. So you guys we have, have we do have at least one Shining reference as a hidden joke in one of our videos. I don't know if anyone ever caught it. I didn't see it in the YouTube comments, but do I know? Do I remember? Viewers, can you can you discover was it the it part is? of that one video when you went ah the Shining? It was yeah <laughs> that was it. <laughs> All the elevated no doors play. makes Kyle so, a very dull. Boy. So what makes you like the Shining as a well? What I just said. Okay. All right. But also, um, it just his um, descriptions are well, – that's the old Stephen King books. His descriptions are really good. Yeah. Um, but also, because it only stars like an isolated family, you don't get a bunch of weird yeah. children's stuff like you do yeah. in some of his other books. Yeah, you know his, what I mean? his books, he is not afraid to go there, right? Yeah. Well, there's, there's something about him that as a novelist, I can see that he's always going to be a better writer than I am because he's just willing to lay it all out. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, I'm not going there. Well, yeah. Why would I do that? I want you to. Censor, but I you want. censor yourself. Well, no. Yeah, see, that's, yeah. That, you that's what they, they do center. say that you're supposed to, you're supposed to just write and not censor yourself. You put your soul on the page. Through, right? but, but, you know, as a sinner, my soul is black. I don't want to do that. I no. also felt early on King was very sensitive to book length. Like Carrie is very short and, mm-hmm. and Shining's fairly short. And then as he got full of himself, he just... Like stop listening to editors and it was like twelve like, hundred yeah, boom, everybody's gonna read this. And they did read it and it wasn't as good for it. Yes. Like it is not a good book because it's twelve hundred pages and confusing. I don't think that's the only problem with and it. And the children. But... And that weird <laughs> that weird scene. Yeah, our a turtle shows scenes. up and saves the day. That's, that's the whole plot. Line. The a space the turtle. children the, the turtle will not help us. Yeah. I did say last year that after my fiftieth book I was gonna read finally read Stephen King because I've actually never read a Stephen King book. Oh. And I didn't. <laughs> Well, I recommend the show or Carrie. Carrie two, is two hundred pages. I was gonna, good. I was just gonna aim high, and I was gonna start with the stand. Well, I, I think like that's a good. I think that's a good place to start because if you ever read the Gunslinger series, he goes into the Stand's universe a lot. So I would say, but it's also a bad book, which is a negative. Read the Stand and then read the Gunslinger, and you'll and maybe Tommy Knockers or something. Like yeah. that. Might be interesting. But but those but, are very strange places to start. I don't think Stephen so. King. Wait, do you think Tommy Knocker? Knocker you think Tommy Knockers is a place to start? Stephen well, King. he goes into that universe. <laughs> well, I, I just think the the Gunslinger series unites all the books together, mm. all of his universes, and he references and that's, that's what, but, but if you're primarily like, I just want to read a Stephen King yep. book, 
you might not dive into the whole universe. I would go with one of his short early ones. And I wouldn't listen sure. to this guy at all. No, 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 no. Pet Cemetery. He doesn't. He doesn't Pet Cemetery like is a good one. I, I recommend Pet Cemetery. But also, yeah, Kyle's right. Carrie's good. Carrie is just, it's kind of iconic as like, it's it just feels like a classic ghost story, mm -hmm. even yeah. though there's no ghosts in it, <laughs> that kind of came about and was part of this town. Mm -hmm. And he just makes it, it's good. What about that one with the semis, the semi trucks? What was, which one was that called? Oh, gosh. You know what I'm talking he about? He wrote several about haunted... Haunted semi trucks, haunted uh, cars, and well, stuff. A normal haunted car was Christine. I don't there know was about Christine. That no, he wrote. He wrote other ones that were like roadkill or something. Yeah, he said something, something like that. that. Yeah. Is it yeah, just because he wanted to do Transformers, but it existed already? Yeah. He wrote a whole book about robot trucks, <laughs> and they were like, "Dude, that already exists." And he's like, "Oh no." I'm gonna call it. I'm gonna call it something else. So it's President Biden's first day in office. His administration has pushed policies that embrace abortion on demand silent speech, and even redefine what it means to be male and female. Join with my friends at Alliance Defending Freedom and be a champion for freedom today. You can help hold the Biden administration and all government officials accountable to the law. ADF is on the front lines, challenging this administration's unconstitutional actions in courtrooms, legislatures, and the public square. They represent everyday Americans like you and me in court, free of charge when their First Amendment freedoms and God-given rights are being violated. But they can't do it without your help. Just $19 a month will help fuel the fight to protect our freedoms. That's just 63 cents a day, less than a comic book. Visit joinadf.com b and pledge your monthly gift of $19 or more to ADF. Is your freedom worth 63 cents a day? That's all it takes to help defend freedom now and for the next generation. Go to joinadf.com slash B with your gift today. All right, what do you got for your number three, All right, Jerry? so I, I actually was going to go into Stephen King too, but I'm going to say the books of Joe Abercrombie in particular, uh, Till They Are Hanged. Have you guys ever read these? Mm -mm. So I really like fantasy stories. Um, I've always liked fantasy. I've read a lot of the fantasy books like the Robert Jordans and the, you know, Martins and... Communist um, Manifesto. Commun mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of other fantasies. I got into Terry Brooks for a long time. Um, but of all of those, Joe Abercrombie is the grittiest and most realistic universe uh, that anybody's created in my experience. I love reading them. They're always really cold. There's always a lot of revenge. It's like revenge story after revenge story. Very interesting. The characters are really well developed. Um, there's one guy... In particular, Logan Nine Fingers that kind of finds his way throughout the whole thing, a bunch of different ones, and um, I just love it because it's almost set in sort of an old West world mm. that becomes almost a Renaissance world. That's what Vikingy too, right? Yeah, it's Vikingy. Uh, it's Vikingy uh, with a Renaissance com I'm combination. I'm asking you. I've read. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> there's it's cowboys. Like, it's a weird universe. And Vikings. Well, and no, because it, it becomes dragons. cowboys later. It sounds I, awesome. I've only read. Uh, so, but, I've only read the Blade itself. So the blade itself is like Vikings meets the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. And then that becomes that that universe grows into a revolutionary period. Interesting. Like um like the French Revolution. So he actually basically mirrors the French Revolution essentially. It's fascinating stuff. So if you get a chance, you know. Sounds like, good. Yeah, it's a fascinating. Expounding on like larger arcs, uh, another reason that I like Mistborn the Mistborn trilogy mm -hmm. is you can read it as a standalone, just those three books, but then he expands it into other uh, time, not timelines, um, but basically he takes eras. his magic system. Yeah. Different eras. Mm -hmm. And so the first one is like traditional fantasy setting with, a, with certain magic powers. And then he goes into a Western setting with those same magic powers. And then the third, third era will be that he hasn't written yet, uh, like a cyberpunk setting and then like yeah. a space era. Yeah, so. it's fascinating to kind of see that that thing kind of with the, the same storyline go yeah. through and the same history and characters. And the weird part about and and this is true for Martin's books too, but there's no magic essentially mm -hmm. until you meet this one guy, and magic always has a massive consequence. So anytime somebody uses it, there's always a huge blowback, and so I love it. I think it's a really good use of the, oh, sounds the great. mythology. I'm brutal. planning on They're brutal. They're I am planning on books. continuing the series, but I got distracted by other books. Highly recommended. Although if you're sensitive to violence, I wouldn't read them. I got distracted by not reading Stephen King. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, my number three uh, is 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Mm. Mm. I, I love the turn of the century adventure tales and like they didn't know what was under the ocean and we still don't. 
kind of. They didn't know what was in space. They didn't know what was in the center of the earth. You know, dinosaurs. But apparently, <laughs> so they just got to use all these settings, and now you can still write books like that. But people are kind of like, yeah, but that's not really up there, and mm-hmm. they get they get all uppity about it, like all oh, science. You know, <laughs> Neil deGrasse Tyson. Science has really ruined diamonds. everything. <laughs> Neil deGrasse Tyson said that this can't work, uh, and I just loved these ages when it, like everything seemed possible for humanity at the time, and then we killed each other in world wars, and that stopped. But there was there was so many fun um, books, the Jules Verne, H.G. Wells, mm-hmm. just exploring what uh, C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy, Heinlein. Um, uh, of exploring the frontiers of what mankind could do. And I like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. It has these interest, interesting anti-imperialist messages that probably mm. weren't very popular at the time where this um, uh, Nemo is going around and he's blowing up warships that, you know, he blames for the death of his family or whatever. It's like, it's a very, very interesting book. And and he predicted a lot of the things that would go into the development of nuclear submarines. So I, I love 20,000 Leagues. I, I would recommend anything really by, by uh, Vern. So... That's cool. I love Jules Verne. Good. Um, I'm going to change my list because you mentioned 20,000 Leagues oh. Under the Sea. I didn't have that on my list, but I'm going to go to one of my backup I'm items. I'm going to go to 20,001. Which references <laughs> which references that book, and that is Sphere by Michael Crichton. Ah, a great one. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, so 20,000 lo- Leagues Under the Sphere. Under the Sphere, <laughs> yes. Um, I love Michael Crichton. I, I like most of the books of his that I've read. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but Sphere is at the top for me. It has... I think Sphere is my favorite Crichton yeah. as well. It has mystery. It has science. It has fiction. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it just... He's he's a master at creating these tense situations and atmosphere and characters that respond in these extraordinary circumstances. Um, and... I don't know what else to say because I don't like giving spoilers. Yeah. So, uh, sure. Sphere, read don't it. Don't be spoiled on it for sure. It's way better than the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Jurassic Park is another good one. But Sphere, I, Sphere is, is, is my favorite of his. And I think I would put Jurassic Park like maybe six. Did you guys like Congo? Yeah, I liked Congo. I love Congo. Yeah. Congo was a good one. This is basically the only one that I've read by him. But Yeah. I would recommend most Crichton. Yeah, right. He had some really interesting, he had interesting themes of like, the dangers of science, which, you know, is like politically incorrect nowadays. But yeah, Sphere's a great one. Very cool. Travis? Dune. Ooh. All right, Jarrett. <laughs> I was... <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, if we're, if we're... Part one not or part allowed two? To, oh, <laughs> dang it. If we're not allowed to use uh, Lord of the Rings, I think Dune is mm-hmm. probably, even though it's science fiction, it's probably my favorite fantasy style story. Um, because it is a fantasy in the stars. <laughs> that's, good. It's just good. Yeah, that's, Dune's a little divisive, as the British say. Mm. And uh, <laughs> you know, some people find it hard to read. Or like, I I love I love Dune. I think it's written really well. I like the politics and. I think it does it all in a believable way for its world. And I, I don't know. I didn't find it very hard to read. Um, well, I think it's because it's a, I, I did find the first half of it very hard to read, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but uh, I also thought it was really interesting because he employs third person omniscient, which is a POV that you, people aren't used to, used to reading in. And I remember reading it and I was like, how is this, like, how do they trans, this is why it failed as a movie is because you can't translate third person omniscient to the screen. Um, and uh, they why didn't, not? they still haven't. <laughs> yeah. But Doom part one did succeed. It was good. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I think that was a good one. Um, since we're getting into classic sci-fi, I went through a period where I read just old sci-fi, like the 1950s pulp stuff that you could find at like a an old bookstore. I'd go through and try to find something that nobody, or it's, what is it, Zwesny, Z- Zelny? There's a bunch of people. But anyway, my favorite one of those was an, was an author. He had three or four books, but his Alfred Bester was his name. And he wrote one called... Um, the Star's My Destination, which is basically the Count of Monte Cristo in space and how how society would change if people suddenly got the ability to teleport. So that's how he kind of always, his stories were always like, how would society change mm. if we had this advance in evolution or this advance in technology? This is your number two pick? Yeah. Oh, okay. And what was it called? The Star's, the My, Star's De- My Destination. He wrote another one. Uh, called the something man. I think Minority <laughs> Report was something. based on it. It was like it was called. You'll look him up and you'll be like. Minority to Report was based on the Minority Report. Right, but wow. Minority Report. The other thing was kind of based on this, 
potentially because it was about it. if somebody had omniscience or not omniscience, but tele tele telepathy and there were levels of tele telepathics, then how would it change like police work and how would mm -hmm. you stop people from I killing think, people and yeah. stuff? It's fascinating. I love story. pulpy sci-fi, especially the covers. They were cool. I just want to hang yeah, those on they my were wall, super you know? cool. Except the babes, like not the ones with the babes. But also the cover yeah, art just the men. often had nothing to do just with the book itself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They like, because often. because no, they, they would yeah. they would exist like just to sell the books. Right. Lady. And yeah. I, I know there's been a lot of issues with authors saying this doesn't represent anything that ever happened in the book. And the yeah. publisher's like, Yeah, you want to sell books? You want to sell books or, or do you not? Sometimes right. sometime we're going to have to go through the most insane book covers that because sometimes you look at it like there's old editions of Lord of the Rings that the guy had never read the book had any idea what it, what it is. <laughs> it's like, what what is this well, painting? Because I know like what's it? Um, yeah. Ursula Le Guin, uh, the, uh, whatever the first book is, the wizard one. Uh, her wizard. That's what it's called. The wizard. The wizard book. The wizard one. Uh, the wizard. Her, her wizard is black. Mm-hmm. But he's displayed as white on all the covers. <laughs> yes. You want to sell books, kid. Yeah. Fantastic. That's so crazy. All right. My number two pick is Band of Brothers by oh, yeah. Stephen E. Ambrose. Oh, that's a good one. And I I like a lot of Ambrose. Um, D-Day is another one that I read mm -hmm. the junk out of when I was a kid. Um, high school. You know, that was like World War II was the setting that, you know, stoked the imagination. Yeah. But only in the imagination. And uh, Band of Brothers, <laughs> Band of Brothers was <laughs> Band of Brothers is a classic. Obviously, it's been adapted into the show, and the Pacific, and all that stuff. But Band of Brothers was, it's arguably like the most readable and approachable of those kinds of books. And it's just it's one of those books that's so highly readable, and every page has you know thirty material facts on it about this person being there and this many rounds fired and this many casualties and here is the armament. And you're reading it and you're like, this is so interesting, like. I would just read lists of inventory of different units in World War II and be excited by it, you know, hmm. but only in the imagination. I think that those were great. Just as a side, there was, I, I love Stephen Ambrose. I also, there's a book written by Dick Winters, the guy that was. Oh yeah, what's that called? It's called, it's called, it's a leadership book. It's like. It's no, called it's, My Name is Dick Winters. No, it was like, <laughs> yeah. it was like, right. I can't remember the name of it, but he wrote it. It's yeah, not I've a biography. It. I haven't read it. It was a really good autobiography and it followed the same story. And so you kind of get a different picture. And he starts out with Stephen E. Ambrose, that punk got everything wrong. <laughs> that punk. <laughs> yeah. Damien Lewis really portrayed me poorly. <laughs> what do you got for number two, Brandon? Well, my list of no specific order. Uh, and your number two is? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say uh, Black Rednecks and White Liberals by Thomas Sowell. Uh, there you go. Um, have to have a soul on the list, of course. Um, uh, in this book, he... It so uh, Thomas Sowell he speaks on uh, economic factors and also socioeconomic factors and also migration patterns and also um, just racial some uh, racial uh, uh, topics as well and this touches a little bit on all of those things. I particularly like it because I think in America we have lost the viewpoint of what racism is. When racism is thrown about as a blanket term for so many things, um, oftentimes what we're actually criticizing when people say that we're criticizing someone's race is criticizing someone's culture. And not all culture is created equal. Some culture is bad. Some culture is good. Um, and to be able to separate those two and make the distinction, I think, is extremely important for us to realize, uh, is extremely important for us to understand in order to heal as a country. Mm. I think so many times when we say uh, rap culture is deleterious to humanity. People think that we're criticizing black people when in reality we're criticizing promiscuity and violence and uh, and uh, elevating those things. So in Black Rednecks and White Liberals, he traces some of the cultural heritage of, of certain aspects of American black culture uh, to Southern redneck culture and even further back to Highland Scott culture and says, it's not a race thing, guys. It's it's a culture thing. Hmm. And he talks about cheese in the book, which oh, which is fine. Now I'm so oh, my I'm cheese. Being, what kind of cheese? You got to read it to find out. Did you guys Raffle. see that cheese commercial in the Super Bowl? I didn't watch the Super Bowl. The one where the lady goes in. There's these two robbers that go into this lady's house and they steal the cheese. 
Mm. And then the guy, dri- they're driving away and then it cuts. And she's like, not my cheese, not my cheese. And then it cuts and it's this cow chasing a car that has cheese in it. That sounds humorous. No, it was all about like how we're stealing cow's cheese. Oh, and how, how, it was like, a thing. how evil it is. <laughs> like, oh, it was a pita thing. It was amazing. It's like the plot <laughs> for a B movie. It. Huh? It's like the plot for a B movie where we're stealing the bee's honey. Yeah, and it's like, not my honey. I was... <laughs> yeah. Travis, what's your number anyway. two Super Bowl commercial? Oh, Super Bowl commercial. Hmm. Well, <laughs> uh, can I just say a book instead? Sure. Okay. Sure. <laughs> uh, so my number two book is uh, The Realm of Two Regards by Jason River. Um, it's a science fiction book uh, about a man who lives in two dimensions simultaneously. And so no matter what he does, he will destroy one dimension or he will... Um, live his best life in the other. And if he tries to help the other one, it's uh, dampening the effects of the other one. So he has to live like a, on the fence in a neutral way his entire life. And it's kind of an exploration of Is it like his left half is in this one at all times? And his right half is in this one? Or is it like, is it warping back and forth? No, it's like his whole body at the same time. So if he's going to reach for a cup somewhere, oh. then... He's still making that same action, but he might be in a different circumstance. And so his... He could be eating a hot dog. He could be eating a hot dog. When was that written? Um, it was from the 70s, I think. Oh. So he didn't steal my idea from my screenwriting class no. that I wrote in college? Mm. <laughs> he's, he's watching this podcast sweating right now. <laughs> so Speaking of stealing, stealing ideas. <laughs> We've all had that happen. What mm-hmm. is your number one? Okay. So, I mean, if we're going to actually new, like number these. <laughs> number one. That's what, you know. This was, uh, I said this is the top five. I do. I do think that um, I've mentioned this before, but not for a while. And it's the Space Trilogy, which I think of as one. Dude, you've picked like 20 books. <laughs> <laughs> it's because they all are related. They're all related. And in particular, Paralandra is my favorite. Um, the entire works of C.S. Lewis yeah. is my number one. Yeah, my, my one book. <laughs> my entire 2023 reading list. <laughs> <laughs> number one. That's right. Well, I do think the Space Trilogy is theologically very interesting. I think it's got a great story. I think Ransom is a fascinating character. Uh, yeah, I've always kind of wanted to make that into a movie. I feel like it's like... The technology's caught up with us. I think we could potentially make it into a movie now, where before it would have been really difficult to do unless we used puppets or something like that. So well, I would have watched that. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, no. Let's I call think up Jim Henson. Even what, what oh, was yeah. the one that uh, He's with uh, Carl Weathers now? Oh, yeah. Is it Thunderbirds? The one that uh, the Dark Crystal. No, the one that George Lucas based his like star fighting on was like the puppets that were flying the airplanes. Oh, I mm. I mean Thunderbirds, they were puppets. Uh, that airplanes. might be what I'm thinking. of. I don't remember George Lucas doing so, anything. I think George that. Lucas said that like like it inspired him as a kid. Like he wanted to make interesting. Like the X wing battles are all like yeah. You know those you, it has the cockpit shot and they're like mm-hmm. like that was all. We could even do that hideous strength as a movie. As much as you hate it, I I think it would be really a good way for us to kind of move that story along at the beginning of the story where they're just in the in the university mm. setting. Or like you know how the it's Clone Wars kind of look like puppets. Like they kind of had that sure. Yeah, that was all based on Thunderbirds. Weird. That's interesting. Yeah. So that's. I can it. see it now. Now that you're saying it, I can see it. Number I think. On, I think if this list is kind of leaning towards like stuff you may not have thought to read, the Space Trilogy is a, a good pick because if you if you read Lewis, you you may not ever encounter the Space Trilogy. You know, you're just like reading his boring theology books and Narnia, and you may you may skip. And there's thousands of those. And there's thousands of boring. <laughs> thousands of Narnia. Thousands books. of Narnia. Countless. Count, there's not thousands. There countless. are countless Narnia books. <laughs> and especially the first two. The third one is very difficult to get through, but the first two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, What's your number one, Kyle? So I broke the rules a little bit. Yeah. What what good are rules? And I can I can make a different pick if you guys demand it. But my I, for my number one, I put The Hobbit. And my... My defense of it is it is a little bit overlooked in terms of everybody saying oh, Lord of the Rings, Lord of the Rings, and Hobbit is kind of seen as the little brother or the, you know, not as developed or like the kid's book. And some of that is true. But Hobbit to me is one of those that gets overlooked and you read it and it's so rich. There's so many great characters, even ones that just appear for a page or two. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just the, I, I, I lean toward, and you can kind of tell from my list, but I lean towards these books that are just almost like a D&D campaign, just a classic like adventure. We're going to go here and fight some giants. We see trolls and 
you know, there was a there was a crazy spider thing, and the, like I, I really love that kind of story, and I think this one does it in such a great um, great small package that you can just read really quick and read it with your kids, and and it has all the goodness and you catastrophe that you can read it Tolkien in one sitting too. Like yeah. you could just sit down and yeah, you a could. little longer than some of the other ones I talked about, but yes, you could sit down and read it in one sitting if you're branded. It's really great for your kids. So, and you'll cry multiple times. Yeah. I find that when I read Lewis to my kids, I'm always like, I can't finish the chapters. What is it? So, so I comes, so comes snow after fire, and even yeah. dragons have their ending. Yes, no, I would, it's beautiful. It's a good direct pick. quote from the book. Good job. Is guys. this acceptable? It is acceptable okay. to. It was on my list. Time. All right. So, my number one book that I didn't order is Pride and Prejudice by Ooh. Jane Austen. Mm. One of the greatest books ever written by the greatest character author of all time who understood uh, the psychological motivations of people and, and wrote- And even women. <laughs> and even women. <laughs> um, is this the one with Keira Knightley? This is the one starring Keira Knightley <laughs> the in the book, yes. Colin Firth um, and Keira The dialogue is among the wittiest dialogue of any book I've ever read. Um, yeah, just the character motivations and- um, yeah, no bad things to say about it. it. This is not a book you can read in one sitting. Mm. <laughs> my wife loves this these. Is... My wife loves Jane Austen, and uh, I've never been able to get through Pride and Bridges. I really, I really should buckle down and. And, and do as it. as the Babylon B, uh, if if you are a fan of the Babylon B, which I assume you are, uh, Jane Austen was a master of satire. Um, a lot of like. Pride and Prejudice is extremely satirical. It, it criticizes the relationships and practices of the people of the day, um, and yeah. Collins and uh, the aristocracy and Mr. Bennett, yeah, yeah great the, characters. The, the more great characters, great dialogue. I, she was the South Park of her day, mm -hmm. it, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Elizabeth Bennett was the Kenny yeah. of her of her day. We should have her come in for an interview. It's, yeah. That's a good idea. She's yeah. with Carl Weathers now. Who's gonna tell him? Um, <laughs> nobody. Else. Don't tell Travis. All right, oh, Travis. What dead. is your number one? What is the best book of all time? Oh, of all time. <laughs> Sweat. <laughs> um, well, I, I was going to say The Hobbit, but another pick is uh, Brave New World. Hmm. I, I think it's an influential book. I think it's um, very uh, potent for today's modern society with the idea of the man coming from a more um, classic world and being immersed as a visitor, essentially, to a world full of technology and um, a lack of emotions where feelings are suppressed and um, where everyone's trying to be beautiful all the time and things like that. But it's another book where it's like, maybe if you're not 18, don't read this book. Mm -hmm. That said, I read it in high school for class because they made me perverts. <laughs> read the words, read the words. Read it out loud. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, it, I think it's a very good book, uh, even though Aldous Huxley is a wacko. Mm. A wacko. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was crazy. Yeah, I yeah, find the debate really interesting think. between 1984 and Brave New World of like, mm -hmm. do they rule through through pain and totalitarianism or do they rule through pleasure? And it's a little bit of both, I think. Yeah. You, know, you which, throw which one got it a right? clockwork orange in there and you've got a, a third option. Mm. Yeah, I haven't, read, 451, I haven't read that one. They also reign with fire. Oh. Mm. Reign of fire. Rain Have of you ever fire? read also I did reign of uh, fire. Under fire. Which is I my number one pick. A, a clockwork orange. Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> reign of fire. Christian Bale. By the way. Good movie. That's a great movie. I went and saw it in the theaters. That mm. was really dumb. Me too. Mm. I've never seen it. Really? Mm. Yeah. There's a whole I've, evolution. I, I've subplot? never seen it because I, I saw it and I went, that looks dumb. And then I didn't see it. I was a creationist at the time. I mean, I still am. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was like, uh, you know, I was very. Yeah, like, dragons. Staunchly, like any, any yeah. show that mentioned yeah. evolution, I was like, ah, this is just so dumb. And yeah, Pokemon. I still Correct. And I still feel like that. But I think that show had some line about evolution and I was yeah. like, that's really dumb. 100%. <laughs> I look at Rain of Fire. One of my friends got a song put in Rain of Fire. It was the first time one of my friends Johnny Cash got cover. successful. <laughs> no, it was the His name was Bob Dylan. No. <laughs> it was it was the credits song. It was called Burn. And it was uh, in 7/8, seven, 7/8 eight, seven, eight time, and it was a rock song and it was oh, an actual worship song. So if you listen to the lyrics, it's all about God. We're gonna burn. <laughs> yeah, no. It's like, going it's to like Tracy, my heart We're burns. Rain burn. of Holy Fire. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so if you go check it out, check out that song called Burn by Mad at Gravity, which was the band's name. Mm. 
And these have been yeah. our top five songs on the end of movie soundtracks. <laughs> yeah. that's, a, that's another list. Motherland by Crystal K at the end of FMA. Let us know if you pick up any of these books and what you think of it. You can email us at podcast at babylonbee.com. Tell us what you're reading too. Maybe we'll read it out on a future podcast. Kyle, right? may I suggest very briefly we pick one book each so to long, not everybody. recommend. Oh, no, oh. To, say, to say not to read. <laughs> you have honorable yes. mentions? I like that. I do. I'm just trying to be sensitive to timing concerns. Mm. But I, I said my honorable mentions were the Conan, the Barbarian short stories. Those are good. Lovecraft short stories, yes. Solomon Cain short stories. Um, I had one other on here somewhere. What did don't you guys read, have for? Don't read Bolo, exclamation Wait, are point. we doing honorable mention <laughs> or not honorable? I'll, I'll, I'll just go through mine quick. You know, Frankenstein uh, was another one. I had, I had the Bible that well, has like to take second place to honorable, honorable mention. mention. <laughs> I didn't know if we were going to do the Bible. Didn't enough. quite make the list. Crime and Punishment, yep. Name of the Wind, amazing, amazing book, yep. but I can't recommend continuing the series. Yep. Uh, the Magician's Nephew. Neither can real- the author. Excellent. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> Magician's nephew, you got really close. Huckleberry Finn and Lies of Locke Lamora, but it auto corrected to Lies of Locke Lakota. So I guess oh, try that one. Is that I good? Guess. Is that okay. try Lies of Locke Lakota? Oh, I, I do had, have a dishonorable. Mention. I had R.C. Sproul's uh, expositional commentaries, all of them. Uh, one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich, the three body problem. I'm actually liking a ton. Um, Red Rising, that series was excellent. So if you ever get a chance to read that, it was awesome. Red Rising series came out a couple years ago. Very good. Gunslinger, um, and the Gunslinger series was really fun. Gunslinger too. is really good. Yeah, so those are the ones I. Those I did have mentions. a dishonorable mention in uh, the Sun Also Rises. Mm. I don't know if you guys were ever made to read that in high school or anything. No. I tried to pick it up recently, just like oh, it's a classic. I'll give it a try, and it's just people drinking and doing other things. That's how classics are sometimes. And then they're like, oh, let's go to France. Or maybe they're in France and they're going to go somewhere else in France. I don't know. I was scrolling through my Goodreads to try to see my five stars and I saw a one star and it was Twilight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, it's I, yeah. not bad. Don't read Twilight. But it was bad. It was bad. But you wanted to keep seeing what happened, you know. And a two star, which I threw across the room in my mind because it was it was an e-reader and I didn't want to actually throw my e-reader across the room, was A God Emperor of Dune. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I never I read, read past that. the first. I, I, I know that there's mixed opinions on the rest of the Dune series, but I felt like the first Dune was so self-containedly good. It doesn't immediately lead into another story. Yeah. It's just... I'm just like, that was great. I loved yeah. it. I don't need to know what happens next. It's so funny you guys read books, uh, books about video games. I think that's such what, a like weird... What? Like, well, Doom, right? No, Doom's not Doom. about a video game. I just said Doom. Oh, there is <laughs> I did not read. No, of Doom I books. did not read and was friends. not on my Goodreads the novellas for Infinity Blade. I didn't read those. What about what about the um, <laughs> Who the novels those? that were attached to Halo? One of my friends read all those. I read I, read, like, I read two last year. Yeah, see, that's what I'm saying. I, people are reading these videos. And they're probably good. Who knows? I mean, I don't <laughs> know. I haven't read them. They're just based on video games. What was that Doom, uh, what was the Doom quote that she had? Rip and tear? <laughs> Was, wasn't you there remember that one? No, wasn't there quotes in the book that were just like ridiculous? Oh, I I don't remember them off the top of my head. I can't remember why I would have looked those up. I'm gonna have to find it. Was it for a podcast or something? Y- you told me that the Doom novelizations had the most insane quotes. They do, and I just don't. I remember. looked up the quotes, and we were you and I were laughing over yeah. them. We shared a great moment, and I'm glad that you remember it. Um. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, thanks for uh, hanging out with us and let us know what you're reading. Podcast at babylonbee.com. We'll see you guys next time.